All right, we're going to continue with world religions and cults, uh, Roman Catholicism. Um, I have the notes to finish up Catholicism, but with the time that we have left this evening, I doubt it's going to happen, but we'll just see how far we get. Um, the, uh, we finished up uh, on the subject of the sacraments, and uh, so we're just going to cover a couple of other key beliefs and we'll see if we get to the second one tonight. Well, we'll get to the second one. We'll see if we finish everything up tonight. Maybe we can. But uh, the first thing, another one of their key beliefs is purgatory. Purgatory. The doctrine of purgatory was developed by the Council of Florence in 1439 and the Council of Trent, which was in 1563. When a faithful Catholic dies in an imperfect state, he must experience purification in a place called purgatory. In order to help those who are there, the living are encouraged to pray for the dead, give alms, perform works for indulgences. Um, and that's a switch from the old days where they would pay money for the indulgences. Uh, they would also then uh, perform penance on their behalf. So not only do you need to try to work for your own salvation, you need to do things for other people's salvation if they're in purgatory. I mean, you think about what kind of system that is. Now, first of all, there is no, just to put it simply, and this, this section on purgatory is not a long one because just simply there is no scriptural basis whatsoever for purgatory. Now, they get, they get some of that from the Apocrypha, which we do not view, and Bible-believing Christians all throughout history did not accept the Apocrypha as inspired scripture as part of the canon of scripture. Uh, there is... Um, there may be in some of the apocryphal books some historical merit to them, but it doesn't mean they are all doctrinally correct or, uh, or should be considered part of the inspired scripture. It was always a Catholic thing as far as uh, uh, in, in the Orthodox, including the apocrypha. Uh, and then a couple other verses that they may use, because um, there's really not much, uh, but one is uh, 1 Corinthians 3.15. I'm just going to turn there for sake of time. You don't have to turn there uh, so we can go on to the next one here. Uh, is uh, 1 Corinthians 3.15, it says, If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. And uh, so that is, that is one verse that they would use. Uh, but the, the, the whole context of that passage has to do with uh, you giving account for your works as far as what sort of work you have done. And so even if, you know, if, you, if, if you have been saved uh, and yet you, you don't have works that count for eternity, you will be saved yet so as by fire all the works get burned and yet you go through, uh, you know, and, and so it's a, in its context, it's more of a figurative sense. Now, the Bible says our God is a consuming fire, so there may be some element of fire in that uh, in when we stand before God. But it's not a purgatory. It's not people staying somewhere for a period of time. It's just simply, yeah, you, you basically, you made it through just because you are saved. The fire burned up all of your works. Uh, but you've, uh, but you yourself uh, make it through, but that's not necessarily. It's not speaking of a place. Notice that verse, or, or what I said. If many man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. So yes, everything else got burned up, and so that's talking about the testing, the trying of your works, and how pure they are, how much they count for God, because every person's work is tried based on what sort it is. It's not based on the quantity. Now, of course, we want a good quantity of works for God, but it is of what sort it is. What kind of work is it? Because people can do a lot, but it doesn't necessarily amount to anything if it is not on the foundation of Jesus Christ. And so that's one verse that they uh, would um, you know would use, but there's not a, it's not speaking of any particular place. It has to do with the trying of the works. Uh, and then another verse here is First Peter uh, chapter one and verse seven. And uh, 
that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. And, and that is... Uh, that was just simply speaking, they were in manifold temptations. They, it was talking about the trying of their faith here on earth. And once again, it's using fire as a picture of that, of, of, of purification. And, uh, I, and I find it interesting that where, uh, it's oftentimes we, it's, it's flipped. Um, what we believe as far as is, is figurative and literal is opposite of what the Catholic Church teaches is figurative and literal. So there are certain things we would say, well, these are just pictures, these are just symbolic, and they would say, no, this is literal. And then there's other things we say, no, this is literal. And then they would say, no, this is symbolic. Um, so it seems, to be, it seems to be flipped around a little bit. Uh, you know, they'll say, they, do, they believe in tradition along with scriptures. Like, no, we believe in just taking the scripture literally, but then the areas of scripture they decide to take literally are things that they shouldn't take literally and fit their agenda, uh, their, their beliefs. Uh, and then there's a verse, like I said, there's a verse from the Apocrypha that also um, they would use, but none of that is talking about going to a place, and there's certainly nothing in the scripture that has to do with... Um, doing things to try to help people get out of purgatory. There's none, none of that. None of that is there. None of that's in Scripture. And so these, these, these were developed by the councils. They were developed by the councils. But when you start with the foundation that tradition, the tradition of man, the councils, the church, of the church, are just as authoritative as the Scripture, well, then they would put stock in those councils, believing that they are speaking just as much authoritatively as uh, the Scriptures do. But, uh, so that's purgatory. That's one of the main big things there uh, in the Catholic Church. And so really, because of the doctrine of purgatory, really it shows there is no assurance. You can't really know for sure because, I mean, you're, you, I mean, you do all these good works and, I mean, you've been faithful. It says, you know, when a faithful Catholic dies in an imperfect state, but you, got it, you still got to be purified. So that still comes back to, well, you have to do all these things, but then you end up going to purgatory anyway, and you got to be purified. And so it's, a, it's just a, it's a contradictory message. It's a contradictory system because, well, do you have to do it or do you not have to do it? And then you do all these things, and you go to purgatory anyway, and other people have to do these things for you. And uh, doesn't not, uh, does not make sense. It uh, doesn't agree with itself. The other key belief here is justification. What is their belief that what is their viewpoint of justification? Now they would say they believe in justification, but how would they uh, how would they view that truth? It's a Bible truth, justification. But what are the, how do they define it? But the Catholic view of justification is progressive. It's a progressive view of justification, starting with baptism and ending with purgatory before getting to heaven. So we believe, and the Bible teaches, the Bible very clear on this, is that justification is instantaneous only through believing on Jesus Christ. So, the, so that's the key difference between justification and a lot of what the Catholic Church teaches, they use a lot of words and terms that are the same as what we would use, but you, it's very important to understand and find out what they mean when they use those terms and those words. Because just because they use those words, just because they use the word born again, term born again does not mean that they think of born again the same way we do when you look at John chapter 3. Uh, when you look at justification or sanctification, doesn't necessarily mean. They don't mean the same things necessarily when a Catholic says it as opposed to when we would say it based on what, how the Bible defines it. So the Bible teaches that justification is instantaneous. It happens right at the moment of faith, and it is, it is through faith. It is only through believing on Jesus Christ, and it is connected with imputed righteousness and not good works. 
And so imputed righteousness is different than earning your way. If something is imputed, it's, 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 it's put on your account, it's put to your account, but it's not something based on something, a, a work that you have done, something that you have earned. Uh, and so let's uh, look at some scripture here, Acts chapter 18. Uh, no, not Acts chapter 18. I'm going to read Acts chapter 18, 38 and 39, then we'll turn to Romans. Uh, but in Acts chapter 18, 38 and 39, it says, Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins, and by him all that believe are justified from all things, from which ye could not be justified by the law of Moses. Now turn to Romans chapter 3. We just have a few passages in Romans and then... Uh, and then one in Galatians here. And this is where I'm not sure how far we're going to get because we're also going to go, uh, when we're done, before we're done with justification, we also have, to, also have to look at James chapter 2. So we'll probably end up stopping before that point. So we're not just rushing through it. But let's turn to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. And uh, verse 19. Romans chapter 3, verse 19, it says, Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. And so you cannot be justified just by simply keeping the law. You can't be justified simply by doing the right things. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, so notice whose righteousness it is, it's the righteousness of God, it's not our righteousness based on keeping the law, but it's the righteousness of God which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And so it's the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe. And so our faith, it says the faith of Jesus Christ, so our faith really doesn't even originate with us either. We need to believe. Jesus is, the Bible says, that Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith. And so faith really starts and ends with him as well. So it's not something that we just worked up in ourselves and, and, and uh, it's something that we, we believe on Jesus Christ and through his faith, it's uh, his righteousness, God's righteousness is imputed uh, upon us, imputed unto us. For all sin and come short of the glory of God, in verse 24, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood, to declare His righteousness, notice there, there it is, to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are past. So the imputed righteousness, imputed would be something that is placed on or accounted or reckoned uh, to uh, as part of you on your account, and but it's not our righteousness that's imputed. There's not it's, it's his righteousness that's imputed, yes. and it comes through faith, uh, comes through believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, to declare, I say at this time, his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of them which believeth in Jesus. Where is boasting then? It is excluded by what law of works? Nay, but by the law of faith, therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. And so, very, very clear, Romans is a crucial book uh, for understanding the doctrine of justification. And, I mean, and it's, it just lays it right out. And I think God, you know, purposely <laughs> inspired his word this way. Uh, regarding the subject of justification, so there would be no doubt whatsoever. I mean, there are some things in the Scripture that aren't quite as clear, maybe harder to understand passages, but when you get to these passages in Romans, he just lays it right out there and, and says it like it is. And then look down at Romans uh, chapter 4 and verse uh, verses 1 through 3. 
Uh, Romans chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. What shall we say then that Abraham our father is pertaining to the flesh hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture, Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. Uh, and in verse 5, but to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Uh, and verse 6, this is more I was gonna, than I was going to read, but hey, might as well keep reading. <laughs> and here we go to um, uh, even quoting the Psalms, even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom, the, unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. And so once again, whose righteousness is it? It is his righteousness. It's the righteousness of God that gets imputed and accounted to, to us uh, without working for it. We didn't work for it. We didn't do anything to earn it. Saying, blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven whose, and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. And so uh, Abraham, he was not justified by works. Um, he was... It, he believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. That's, in being, uh, that's imputed righteousness. It was counted to him. And um, his faith is counted for righteousness. So that was, the faith was not a work. It was simply, okay, you believed in what God has said and what God has done, what Christ has done, and that is enough. Then God puts his righteousness on the person. Uh, and since we're not going to go any further tonight uh, for the rest of these passages, go back to 1 Corinthians 13, I'm sorry, 3, 1 Corinthians 3. You know, should, uh, just have you look at this passage here. I read uh, that verse earlier, but um, I want to just show you some things and maybe be a challenge to us in our own Christian life. This is not talking about purgatory, but it is a very important passage uh, regarding making us uh, think about what our lives consist of. What do we fill our lives with? And uh, let's go back. Let's see. Where are we going to start? Um, verse, let's start at verse 6. I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. And so what it shows is in evangelizing, uh, in giving the gospel, trying to reach people for Christ, uh, there are some people that plant. Maybe you're the one who initially gives a gospel tract, or you get to talk to somebody, and, and maybe, maybe nobody has talked to them, given them the gospel before. Maybe somebody has. Um, but you get to give them that gospel tract, or you get to talk to them, or you get to give them a John and Romans, or, or whatever it might be. Or maybe it's, I'm here preaching a message, and there's a lost person here in the crowd, and maybe they've never heard the gospel clearly presented before. Or, uh, so somebody's planting the seed. Or then somebody's already planted, and so somebody else comes along, and then waters that. Maybe, maybe somebody's already heard the gospel, but then it, then it gets preached from the pulpit, or maybe you get to talk to somebody and reinforce what they've already been told in the past, and you're watering that seed. Neither of those, not one of those is better than the other. So it's not, well, or maybe you get to be the one that is right with them when they trust in Christ as their Savior, and they make a profession of faith. They, they ask God to save them. Well, is that person more important than the person who initially gave them the gospel all that time ago or however long ago it was, maybe a short time or a long time ago? Well, here he says, Neither uh, uh, I have planted and Apollos watered, but God gave the increase, so then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but that God giveth the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one. So they're looked at in the same way by God. You say, well, I didn't get to be the one right there. Somebody else got to lead them to Christ. Yeah, but maybe you were the one who was, maybe you were the one praying for them. Maybe you were the one uh, who initially gave them the gospel that didn't necessarily take root and bear fruit at that time, 
but later on there was fruit. God looks at all that as the same, and ultimately the glory goes to God because he's the one, that get, his, ultimately God is the one that gives the increase. Mm -hmm. The increase is not on your shoulders to get, but we just, we just give an account to God based on what our labor is. Verse 9, notice that, For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's building. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon, but let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. So, you know, there's, there's all kinds of materials you can use to build. But uh, you're not going to build a new house with popsicle sticks. You know, that would take a lot of popsicle sticks. Better get, have some tasty popsicles because you're going to be eating a lot of popsicles for a long time before you have enough for that house. But notice, for other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man build upon this foundation, this foundation of Jesus Christ, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, all different kinds of things can be built upon kind of makes me think about all those that claim to be doing things in the name of Jesus, but yet not all the materials are the same. Uh, every Verse 13, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. Now, we could take that literally. I'm not saying that's symbolic or figurative. It's possible that when we stand before God, maybe your works will... He'll, be, he'll reveal our works and there'll be a fire because God is a consuming fire and, and it'll be, maybe, maybe we'll see works burned up, you know, when we, before God, certainly. So that, that is what it says. It, does, it just simply doesn't say in, in uh, well, well, keep reading here in verse 14, if any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. But it's, it's the, the testing of it is not based on the quantity, but it's on what sort it is. Is it something that is going to make it through the fire? I um, saw a $20 bill today. I, I love when I get to see these bills. $20 bill that said this is you know, legal tender or, or something of that nature and is able to be exchanged for lawful money. And it was a $20 bill from 1950 before the gold standard was completely removed. And um, so at that point, they recognized this note here is not lawful money. It could be exchanged for lawful money. Yeah. But then they changed it. It took us off the gold standard, I think, in the 70s. And then the wording on the bills changed to where, oh, this is legal tender and is, you know, for debts, public and private. But at the bottom, where it says $20, it says right above it, will pay to the bearer on demand $20, which is saying that note there, that is not $20 because there's something else that's backing it. It's gold. It was gold backing it at the time. Now, which is going to make it through the fire? The gold or those bills, <laughs> if they were to be tested by fire, which is going to remain? Uh, it's the gold. And so, so it is in our Christian life. There's a lot of things that we, that it might look like it represents something very valuable, but it's as worthless as the paper it's printed on. Mm -hmm. And it's going to go through the fire and it's going to be burned up. But the gold is something that remains. The gold, silver, precious stones. But then you get wood, hay, stubble, things that don't last in the fire. Uh, verse 15, if any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Yet so as by fire. It's like saying there's going to be a whole lot of fire there. There's going to be, um, you know, the works are going to be burned up, but yet he, he's still saved. But that's not teaching a place that a person is going to and having to suffer for a while and then you got to do stuff to get them out of purgatory. There's none of that there. It's simply talking about the judgment day of standing before God. It's talking about the person who is saved. They're already saved. Um, but he is... But they will make it through that uh, judgment uh, 
if they are saved. And then if you're standing at the judgment seat of Christ, you are saved. But yet there still be account for the works. But it's, it's a good uh, reminder for us to recognize and, and be aware of, be thinking about what, what, what sort of works are we doing? Are we doing things that are enduring, that are of something of substance, or are we filling it up with a lot of things, a lot of fluff, a lot of things, but if, if there was all to be set on fire at the judgment, would it be stuff that lasts? And you know, I, I, um, I get more and more conscious of that in, in what I think about. And it's like, it's, it's possible to fill your life up with a lot of activity, but it's not necessarily what's going to make it at the judgment seat of Christ. And that, that I try to be aware of that, mindful of that, thinking, boy, I don't want to just, oh, I feel so busy, I'm doing all of this stuff. And you can even be doing stuff for God, but... We, we need to be careful that it is actually for God and it's what it is of substance and getting back to what is going to last and building the, putting the right materials on that foundation of Jesus Christ rather than just having satisfaction as, well, at least, you know, my schedule's full. I've got all kinds of things to do. I'm even doing stuff for the Lord. But is it, is it what is enduring? What, is it something that is, uh, has eternal value or is it just something that is that is fluff. Um, I saw a, on my Facebook, I don't, I don't know how I saw this, but there was a, a service in progress after we were done with our service here on Sunday, and I, I saw somehow on Facebook this popped up. Maybe it was an advertisement, a sponsored post, but this was from a Pentecostal church, and, and they were talking about missions, and they were talking about uh, you know giving money toward missions, and, and, you, and I'm getting ready for, like, he's going to talk about something of great substance. Now, he did mention planting more churches, which I don't necessarily want to see more Pentecostal churches planted. Uh, but the first thing he was talking about was these fun activities for the youth to try to reach more young people. And I forget what the exact examples were, but I was thinking, I don't really think about putting missions money toward that. I went into missions money. I mean, there's nothing wrong necessarily with having youth activities, but I didn't, I didn't really associate that with, yeah, give toward missions so then we can have these big, big fun events for, for the youth. That was, that's not really where my mind goes. Um, where do I want to see our missions money go? I want to see it go toward what is enduring and substantial, the preaching of the gospel, and the planning of churches, distribution of God's word. All the, those are the core things. Now, the Buckinghams, they've had good, uh, good time having a basketball ministry, but that's, not what we're, that's just a little component of what they're doing. Yeah. He's been doing something like that. But I was thinking about having these big, fun, party-type events. How much of that's going to get burned up? And how much of that is going to remain? Just that, just uh, just thinking about that. But point is, they're going to give an account to God for that, and God will have the final say. So I'm not going to. I don't know the whole situation of how they do those things, but I, I'm not going to completely. You know, I'm not going to sit in the place of God on that one. But but we can at least in our lives and in our church, we can emphasize and prioritize those things that are most substantial and things that count for eternity, and things that will last. But you don't have to go to purgatory for that. Uh, we have the lives we've been given here to count for Christ, and, um, and then someday we will stand before God in the judgment. And it's important that we're ready to meet God while we're here in this life. Uh, purgatory is a completely made-up place, and it is not something that is... Um, scriptural at all and especially think about other people having to do things to get you out of there no no but let's let, let us live a life that's aware and conscious of what counts for Christ the most 
and not just filling it up with stuff. And, and sometimes I feel like life goes by so fast that yes, it's so filled up with even good things that I, some of it can be lacking at times because life just races by. But let's, let's be mindful of that. And, and most of all, my desire is whatever I do, whatever we do, is that the touch of God is on it. That's the most important thing, that we bathe it in prayer, that we just seek the Lord, make sure we're doing exactly what He wants us to do.